Today, we're at Camp Lejeune in Jacksonville, North Carolina. This is one of the largest military bases in the world. The meeting this afternoon is open to the public and thousands of soldiers are expected to attend along with their families. The people of this section of North Carolina are still reeling from a freak storm that hit the coast, causing millions of dollars in damage. Many have asked if these storms that we're having throughout the world have any spiritual significance or biblical significance. In a future Hour of Decision broadcast, I'm going to answer those questions. This past week, we have been spending time on two great university campuses. Early in the week, we were at Carolina State, and later in the week on the beautiful campus of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Every year, it is my privilege to spend a part of my time on campuses of colleges and universities in various parts of the world. I'm convinced that the great struggles of our time are won or lost on the university and college campuses and in the minds of young people. It is for that reason that we're planning to spend more and more time with university students. People ask me, what is the religious situation on the campuses of American colleges and universities today? I've asked this question a number of times in recent months to educators and campus religious leaders. I find a great difference of opinion. Some say there's a religious revival and others say that it is only a revival of religious inquiry. The typical approach to such problems today is statistical, and the statisticians will tell you that one-fourth of the four million college students are active in church or church-related work. An additional quarter of these students are involved in some church program each year. Also, nearly 90% of the American University students participate in formal or informal religious meetings or discussions. These figures, however, do not indicate whether the students are coming to a personal faith and encounter with Jesus Christ. Dr. McKnight, Dean of Students at Columbia said, I've been in the Dean's office for more than 20 years and never have I seen such a wide interest in religion among the students. Nathan Pusey, president of Harvard University says, what has been carelessly referred to at Harvard as a religious revival is obviously no such thing. It is rather only one additional manifestation of the broad movement widely evident today in Western culture which stems from discontent or with a refusal to be satisfied with what has come to seem as exclusive, arid, and uncompromising secular approach to life." End quote. Yet at Harvard, there is no question that church attendance is up. For example, in 1936, the average attendance at the Episcopalian services at Harvard was only about 35 students. Today, more than 400 attend regularly. Candlelight services, which drew as few as 10 students in 1947, now often draw as many as 200. Nor is there any question but that college religion courses have greatly expanded both in number and attendance. In my opinion, religion is not dead on the campus, but is probably more alive than at any time in this century, as we've seen demonstrated time after time during the past week on the campuses of these North Carolina schools. The facts seem to be that the American University campus today is a desperate battleground between Christ and Satan, and that the controversy is becoming more intensified every year. A pastor near a college recently said that he noted definite increases in Sunday services from students, yet he sees little definite results spiritually and in practical everyday living. Stanley Rowland says in the New York Times that on the college campus there exists not so much a religious revival as a religious search. There are many obstacles on the campus to a student living an all-out Christian life. Arrayed against him are many atheists who deliberately twist the truth. However, one of the greatest obstacles facing university students today is the indifference of Christians themselves. There are hundreds of Christians who make up the great army of administrators, teachers, and laymen on the university campuses, but many are too preoccupied with the cares of this life to be much concerned about the spiritual welfare of tomorrow's leaders. Many of them are actually afraid to openly witness for Christ. We are in danger of educating our young people intellectually and building strong bodies, but we're not balancing it with moral and spiritual education. 
I've been amazed at how many devout Christians there are on the faculties of many of our universities across the nation, but who are afraid for one reason or another to make their witness felt. During the past few months, however, I've sensed a movement of the Spirit of God on the campus. While we may not say it is a religious revival, yet at least there's a revival of interest in religion. There is a combination of intellectual curiosity and spiritual wistfulness. Thus, we have the beginning of what I believe to be a revival. Curiosity, spiritual wistfulness, and interest in spiritual things. These stirrings can be used in either direction. If we as Christian leaders do not organize to capitalize on this interest, Satan will. And if he does, this movement could lead thousands of brilliant young minds further than ever from the truth, and we would feel the impact in the next generation. Dr. John Bailey said three years ago at Edinburgh, I would say that never in any culture has intellectual life so lost the sense of ultimate destination as has the Western nations. We have so much knowledge and so little wisdom, and knowledge without wisdom is not only futile but terribly dangerous, end quote. We have witnessed in our own generation an object lesson of this statement. Before the First World War, intellectualism in Germany was beyond anything the world had ever known. However, they had reached a condition of spiritual neutrality that had no parallel at that time within Western culture. They had no unifying philosophy of life. There was a sort of vacuum at the center of it all. The intellectual life of Germany eventually fell a victim to a new philosophy of life that had begun to be preached, which was the Nazi ideology. Nazism was something to fill the vacuum. It was something to cement the community with corporate purpose. While Nazism has been destroyed, another philosophy of life is making a bid for the intellectual life of the students. It is no longer Nazism, but communism. Communism is making an offer of a way out of our intellectual morass, an integration instead of confusion. It offers direction in place of aimlessness. It offers an all-embracing purpose in place of hundreds of individualisms. Communism is actually a religion. If we construe it to be an economic or a political system, we will oppose it with the wrong weapons. Communism is a godless religion. Mankind has always sought something bigger than himself in which to believe. Those who have no living God to worship will manufacture gods of clay or they will worship the sun, the moon, or the fire. This is true of primitive peoples. It is also true of some brilliant educated persons. If they have no real God, they will find a false one in which to believe in. The ancient Athenians built an altar to the unknown God. Communism's missionaries have thus carried their materialistic gospel into the uttermost parts of the world. The avowed purpose of all communists is to transform the world into a communist world. Their missionary literature is being distributed throughout the world. Tons of publications were seen in Latin America. Communism has a doctrine of baptism. They baptize infants in East Germany. Parents dedicate themselves to bring up their children under atheism. They have a doctrine of confirmation. They have a catechism. They demand confession of all crimes against the government. They demand conversion. They are evangelists out preaching their gospel of materialism. One professor said, however, but what a purpose and what a price they demand. Another professor has said, the question above all others that confronts our universities today is, have we a substitute for communism? Is there a philosophy or a faith to which young people can believe in and give themselves to such as fanatical young communists are offering themselves to world revolution? One of the reasons that communism often appeals to young people is its challenge, hardship, and suffering. Turgenev. The Russian author quoted the words of a revolutionary leader to a young woman who wished to join his movement. Do you know what awaits you, he asked? I know, she replied. The leader went on, cold, hunger, abhorrence, derision, contempt, abuse, prison, disease, and death. I know, the girl replied, and I am ready. I shall endure all blows. What is there in our university life today in America to match this communist spirit of self-sacrifice? Is there any philosophy that can outmatch it, outthink, outlive, and outdie the communist? Has the average American become so saturated with the love of comfort and ease and status symbols that we lack the necessary strength and stamina to win the ideological struggle? The only philosophy that can hope to win the world is Christianity with a cross at its heart. 
And that cross is the symbol of sacrifice even unto death of the Lord Jesus Christ who died and shed his blood for our sins. It may be true that having successfully put a man into space is doing something to our deflated national ego, but it will take something more than this limited achievement to win back for America the respect and the allegiance of mankind. The greatest need today is not more satellites, but that we begin now to give the world a faith and a philosophy in which to believe. The greatest need today is not more satellites, but a burning, searing Christianity that will capture the minds of our young people on the university campus. It is within the context of the Christian philosophy that Western civilization is developed, but it is doomed to swift disintegration and decay if it ceases to be basically a Christian philosophy of life. It is this fact which lays so heavy a burden of responsibility on all the higher seats of learning which are entrusted with the task of forming the minds of the rising generation. I've tried to emphasize this past week to the faculty and staff the tremendous responsibilities they have in training these young people. I've tried to emphasize that the true end of all education is not the accumulation of knowledge alone, but the acquisition of wisdom. And knowledge is profitable to us only if we use it to glorify God and help our fellow man. But as was said several thousand years ago in words which are as true today as they were when first uttered, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. As a result of the secularistic and humanistic trend in our teaching today, we are beginning to reap a whirlwind. We've ruled out moral convictions and taken God from the hearts of our young people. They have no rock upon which to build their lives. They are floundering, restless, and confused. This is one of the reasons the nation is being flooded with an abnormal obsession with sex that could eventually destroy the country. Of all the ideas which shape the destinies of men, the religious concept is basic. By religion, we mean neither sectarianism nor secular dogmas, but the broad need for man to understand his existence and relationship to Christ. Mankind needs to worship, needs incitement to love, and above all, needs a spiritual rebirth and a reconciliation advocated and offered by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Education, progressive or otherwise, cannot fill the void of men's hearts. Neither can secular success, social and economic security. You cannot void the fact of God as attempted by Karl Marx or John Dewey. Across your life is indelibly written, made in the image of God. And try as you might, you can never get away from it. The Christian faith gives man something that he needs, even when he has obtained all other things. This is the ultimate certainty which neither science nor philosophy can supply. The cross of Christ is now and always will be foolishness to the world that is too arrogant to accept a superior. But this fact remains. Those who have put their faith in the merits of Jesus Christ have found something that cannot be found in human philosophy and secular society. Learning minus God equals confusion and chaos, just as a house with good design minus a foundation equals disaster. A student said to me some time ago, something deep inside me yearns for God, but the textbooks have told me that I'm just another animal bound for oblivion. Why should I take up all the restrictions of the Christian faith when I shall die like an animal? I said to him, don't you believe it? Your conscience, your reason, and the signposts of history point to the all-important fact of God and Christ. Even now, the Holy Spirit is saying to you, you ought to get right with God. You need God. You ought to live for him. In this clear call is God's faith in the dignity of man. You were not made for frustration. You were not made to be a confused animal like a beast at prey. You were not made to be torn apart by temptation and filled with sin and its consequences. You were made for God. Jesus said, he that hath the Son hath life. Do you have Jesus Christ? Have you trusted him for salvation? Have you said goodbye to those forces of selfishness, lust, and sin which seek to destroy you? You can do it today. You can accept Christ and experience his peace and joy in your heart. Jesus said, him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Do it now before it's too late. Ah, but you cannot come to Christ intellectually alone. Jesus said before you can come to him you must become as a little child and be converted. We say to our children, be like grown people. But Jesus said, be like children. 
Become a little child in simple childlike faith in me and I will transform you and make you a new person. I am convinced as I've seen demonstrated this week as scores of young people have come to know Jesus Christ as Savior that your life and mind can be filled with Christ. This satisfies the intellect. It satisfies the heart. It satisfies the emotions. It satisfies every phase of man's life. Give your life to him as Savior today. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that we will repent of our sins and receive Christ by faith at this moment and that our lives will be changed by him. We pray that thou wouldst bless the students of America, these four million young Americans that will be leaders of tomorrow's nation. We pray that thousands of them in the next few months will bow at the foot of the cross in simple faith and come to the Savior. For we ask it in his name. Amen.